our faith versus our reality. <laughs> I just thought that was a great title to this message. Our faith versus our reality. There is this conflict that rages between what we're believing God for in faith and our reality. Do you ever notice that? Do you ever notice that conflict that kind of takes place between what you're believing for and your, and your reality? <laughs> Here's this thing I'm believing for. I'm believing for God's intervention. I'm believing for God's provision. I'm believing for this miracle to happen. I'm forgiving for, believing for this breakthrough in my finances, this breakthrough in my marriage, this breakthrough in my family. I am believing God for this, this impossible thing to happen. I'm believing God for, for something that only he can do. And yet here's my reality. There's been no breakthrough. There's been no deliverance. There's been no blessing. There's been no miracle. Here, here's, here's my reality. And so this conflict rages between what we're releasing our faith for, what we're believing God for, this thing, Lord, that only you can do. And then there's our reality. You tracking with me? Now the conflict is, listen to me, the conflict is not necessarily doubt and unbelief. The conflict is reality. The conflict is, and this is the way things really are. Let me ask you something. What is, what is the conflict between your faith and your reality right now? Think about it. Just think about it for a minute. What is the conflict that rages between your faith and your reality in your life right now? I want to speak to you in this series about what it takes for our faith to be transformed, to transform our faith, to transform our reality. What it takes for our faith to transform our reality. I don't know if I can say that any different. Um, what it takes for this faith in me to transform the reality I'm experiencing so that what I'm believing for, I am receiving. The, I've said this before, and I don't know if, if y'all agree with it. It's okay to disagree. You can disagree. But I believe this with all my heart. God is the most powerful thing in the universe. I mean, he really is. He is the most powerful thing in the universe. Hey, thank you. And the second most powerful thing in the universe is faith. Because faith has the power to move the hand of God, the most powerful thing in the universe, to break into our reality and change it into his reality. And listen, God's reality is not our reality. God's perception, how he sees things, is not, how we, is not our perception of how we see things. What's happening in the heavenly realms is that it looks a whole lot different than what happens in the worldly realms. God's reality is not our reality. And the most powerful thing in the universe is God Almighty. The second most powerful thing that has the power to move his hand into, to transform our reality into his reality is faith. It's faith. It's faith. So I want to talk to you about seeing your reality transformed into God's reality through your faith. Our faith has the power to bring God's intervention, to bring God's transformation, 
to bring God's blessing, to bring God's deliverance, to bring God's healing, to bring God's miracles. Faith has the power to move our mountains, slay our giants, enable us to walk on the waters of impossibility and knock down Jericho walls. That's how powerful faith is. It just amazes me. It's just, it amazes me. I, uh, Jesus said something in Mark 9.23. He said this. If you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. You know why Jesus said that? Boys, y'all know why Jesus said that? Because all things are possible. Because he wanted his people to know that all things are possible through faith. That's kind of a no-brainer. I personally believe he said that because he wanted to let us know that it's the second most powerful thing in the universe. (laughs) That thing called faith. So let's pray and let's ask the Holy Spirit to prepare us, prepare us to receive his word. Father, we, we come to you uh, today with anticipation of what you're going to say and do in our lives that will transform our reality. Give us ears that will hear this morning. Give us eyes that see what your spirit is doing and hear what your spirit is saying. Eyes and ears, Lord. Open our eyes and open our ears to what your spirit is saying and what he is doing in our lives, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to say something, a few things to you over this uh, series that you may or may not have heard before. You know, when, when preachers preach on faith, the people that have been engaged in the faith movement for a lot of years, it's kind of like redundant stuff. You kind of heard it before and it's good. It's, it's refreshing to hear things you've heard, even if you've heard them before, it's good to re-establish re, uh, some of those principles of faith. But I'm going to say some things to you that you probably haven't heard before. And I want you to, I want you to lay hold of them. I want you to research them if you need to. But I'm going to say to you that if you grasp them, you're going to begin to see your reality change. And so over this series, we're going to be talking about some things you might think, huh. Kind of what I did when the Holy Spirit was revealing it to me. Huh. You guys are quiet today. <laughs> Golly, I'm, I'm doing my best up here. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Well, this morning we're going to be looking at several examples of, out of God's word about uh, faith transforming reality. You ever notice how, how the, uh, the less you're influenced by God's word, the more you're influenced by the world? Did you ever notice that? Do you ever notice how the less you're influenced by God's wor- word, the more you're influenced by people? Well, have you ever noticed how the less you're influenced by your faith, the more you're influenced by your reality? That's kind of where I'm at. That war of flesh and reality, that, that influence of reality on my faith terminology of laws because uh, it gives us that thought of accountability. We're held accountable to laws, right? Um, it just gives us that thought. You know, whether we know the laws or not, what do the, what do the police say? You know, when you get busted for some law, and you say, I didn't know about that law. And they say, well, ignorance of the law is no excuse. <laughs> well, it's the same way with these laws. Ignorance of the law is no excuse. Uh, I started to use the terminology. Remember, it's just a term, laws of faith. I started to use the terminology, steps of faith, principles of faith. But I wanted to use the laws because I really feel like that carries that sense of accountability. And I really believe the Holy Spirit is after us 
to understand there's an accountability when it comes to the laws of faith. That we've got to operate with accountability and the laws of faith that have the power to transform our reality. Now let me quickly define faith for those of you who are perhaps new to God's prerequisite for pleasing him. Did you know that God had a prerequisite for pleasing him? Did you know that? Hebrews eleven six. 6, but without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Now, impossible in the Greek there, it's translated powerless or weakly or disabled, unable to be done. It's impossible. It is literally unable. You're unable to please God in this capacity without faith. So faith is a prerequisite to pleasing the Lord, according to that passage. Now, there's other ways we please the Lord. We please the Lord through our giving to the poor. We please the Lord through our worship, and Scripture is real clear about that. But we do those things out of faith that's in us that pleases the Lord. So, uh, so faith is how we please the Lord. Now, just meditate on that for the rest of your life on earth. <laughs> Why not? You're going to meditate on something the rest of your life. Meditate on that. This is how it please you, Lord. Faith. <laughs> Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. That's the New King James Version. Now listen to the, the New Living Translation. Same scripture. Faith is the confidence that we... Uh, faith is the confidence that we... That what we hope for will actually happen. It gives us assurance about these things we cannot see. So, so wrap, wrap your mind around the definition of faith, of what faith is. Faith is both substance and evidence. The, the, your faith is a substance of those things you're believing for. It's, your faith is the evidence of those things you're believing for. It, it's, it's a substance of your walk and the, the evidence of your talk. Faith is this tangible, tangible thing. To you, it may just be a word. To God, it looks like something. It's tangible to him. And that's why it's okay to begin to confess what we're believing God for. Lord, I am believing you. I have faith for my healing. I may have not received it yet, but I have faith for it. I may not have received that miracle yet, but I have faith for it. I may not have entered in to your blessing yet, but I have faith for it. My bank account may be empty, but I have faith you'll supply all my needs according to your riches and glories. It is a tangible thing in us, and God sees it. So faith is both substance and evidence for what we have yet to receive in our reality. But in God's reality, our faith uh, looks like substance and evidence of what we will receive. Let me say it again. For us, it's what we're yet to receive, and God's reality is what we will receive. So he sees this faith. Think about it like this. Let's just say that you're believing for uh, God for a financial miracle, supernatural open door of window from heaven to pour out blessings on your finances. You're just believing God. This is, this is your conflict. You are believing God for financial miracle that you need. And you're believing by faith. Well, in his reality, he is not just standing there ready, or, or standing there uh, ready to release something. He is standing there ready to receive something. God's on the other side in his reality, ready to receive something, not just release something. And what he's ready to receive is the substance and evidence that he is looking for. We call it faith. Faith is not substance and evidence for us. Faith is substance and evidence for him, for the Lord. And I like to add, for his pleasure. So 
So faith is both substance and evidence of things not seen in our reality, but is seen in God's reality. And that just means God, that means God is eyeballing your faith, Craig. God is eyeballing your faith, Norma. He's eyeballing your faith. <laughs> looking for it. He's looking for it. Where is it at? Where is it at, Naomi? Where is that faith at? He's, see, he's, up, he's up there. Like, he, he's not just ready to uh, release. He's ready to receive. Make sense? We get it all messed up. We think it's all about us receiving. Huh. It's all about God receiving. And when he receives, he just changes our reality into his reality. He breaks his reality into our reality where all things are possible, where you walk on the waters of impossibilities, where the walls come crashing down, where the mountains are moved. It's like you're holding this winning lottery ticket. You're holding this winning lottery ticket. You have in your hand, it's a tangible thing. It's a substance, and there's evidence in this lottery ticket that you won. Well, here's your faith. And to God, it's this tangible substance, and it's evidence in him that you've won. Now, don't go out here saying, Pastor said it's okay to go buy a lottery ticket. That's not what I'm saying. Uh, please don't hear that. Now, if you do buy one and you win three and a half million dollars or more, you know, you can keep 500,000, donate the rest of the church. We'll build that phase out there. I'll glorify God and say, hey, go buy another. <laughs> okay, number one, law of divine guidance. I'll go through these as quickly as I can. Law of divine guidance. First law. If you're taking notes, you can write down the law of divine guidance. We have to have God's guidance to see our reality changed by his power. We have to have God's guidance. It's not something we can just assume. It's not something we just hope for. It's not something we can guess about. We need to know the will of the Lord on the matter. We need to have the voice of the Lord on the matter. We need to have the guidance of the Lord on the realities and the struggles in our realities that we're facing when we're asking God to break into our reality with his reality and transform our reality to his reality. We need to know that God's leading us. We need to know God's will on the subject. It's the law of divine guidance. The good news is the Holy Spirit is our compass to help us navigate through the challenges of our reality. Remember, it's our reality conflicting with our faith. That's the war. That's the raging conflict. John 16, 13 says this. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you of things to come. Now, that scripture covers a lot of things, but one of the things it covers is there is the Holy Spirit that is our guide into all truth. The Holy Spirit will uh, guide us, give us direction. Our faith is based on hearing the Lord, based on his instructions, based on his guidance out of his word, based upon his guidance of the spirit. That's what we base our faith on. God said, God instructed, God showed me, God said to, to Peter, step, come, step out of the boat. God spoke and instructed Joshua, march around that Jericho wall. We base our faith on the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Without the guidance of the Holy Spirit, what are we doing? You know what we're doing? We're following the inclinations of our own heart. Scripture says you have not because you ask not. And then when you ask, you ask amiss. In other words, you asked it out of the instructions and desires of your own heart. You missed God. So if you want to see God change your reality and break into your reality because of the power of your faith, then understand the law of faith is divine. The first law is the law of divine guidance. <clears throat> 
You know, those guys, and we'll look at one of those passages in a minute, but they had a God said moment, you know, Peter, Joshua. Uh, they had, a, they had, a, they had a, a God said moment. We see it all through scripture where the, where the God said, where God spoke to them. In fact, y'all remember, y'all may or may not remember that story, but let's read it. Matthew 14, 26. When the disciples saw him walking on the water, Jesus comes walking on the water. They're, they're, in, the, they're in the ship. He comes walking on the water. They were terrified. In their fear, they cried out, it's a ghost. I still don't understand that one. Uh, you know, why do they think they're seeing a ghost? This is Jesus. But anyway. But Jesus spoke to them at once. Don't be afraid, he said. Take courage. I'm here. Then Peter called out to him, Lord, if it's really you, tell me to come to you walking on the water. Yes, come, Jesus said. So he, he had that God said moment, right? Yeah, come, come. And so Peter went out over the side of the boat and walked on the water toward Jesus. But when he saw the strong wind and the waves, he was terrified and began to sink. Save me, Lord, he shouted. Jesus immediately reached out and grabbed him. Uh, you have so little faith, Jesus said. Why did you doubt me? I'll tell you why you doubted him, because he's he got his eyes on the reality. <laughs> this is defying the laws of physics and a bunch of other laws. You know, I'm walking on the water here. I'm pretty sure that's why he <laughs> doubted. That's what we do. <laughs> we get our eyes on reality and, and doubt sets in. All right? Three million dollars. Three million dollars? Like with Z. The law of divine guidance instructs us not to step out without a God said moment. What was that credit card commercial? Don't leave home without it. <laughs> you don't step out without that God said moment. All those things that, that are in conflict with your reality and your faith, you need a God said moment. You're going to fight those battles with a God said moment. You're going to win those victories, listen to me, with a God said moment. You're going to see the walls come down. You're going to see uh, the impossibilities, the giants fall because you have a God said moment. Don't leave home without it. The law of divine guidance, though, I want to say this and make it as clear as I can, is not always about hearing the voice of the Lord. It's not always about this audible voice. It's about discerning how the Holy Spirit is leading you. It's about discerning. Well, the Holy Spirit is saying, go here. I, I just sense he's saying, go here. I have, uh, I have this discerning that the Holy Spirit is leading me. And that can happen over a, a span of time. And it's important you understand that there's a span of time where the Holy Spirit brings confirmation that he's leading you. It's not always about, thus saith the Lord. You know, we play Bible roulette. Lord, if this is you, I'm going to open up the scripture. And you're going to talk to me. Boom, boom. Then in Nebuchadnezzar's 18th year, oh, it's about Nebuchadnezzar. <laughs> no, it's, listen to me. It's, it's about discerning or discovering, uh, understanding how the Holy Spirit is leading you. He's leading you down this course, down this path of a divine guidance that will help you navigate through all the struggles of your reality. And suddenly you're here Maybe I need to shift over here. Maybe I need to go over here. Maybe I need to step out closer here. Maybe it's not about this at all. Maybe the Lord has just confirmed me that this is not the way. So hearing the voice of the Lord is about discerning the Holy Spirit's guidance. The one who guides you in all truth. I pose a question to the Lord all the time. All the time I'm asking the Lord, Lord, what about this? And he does not always answer me with a God said moment. Sometimes he just takes me through that process. And in that process, I'm following the peace. I'm a peace follower. 
I like to tell people peace, peace is like the umpire calling a baseball game. You're either safe or you're out of here. <laughs> and so if I don't have a peace, I'm out of here. And so I, I discern the guidance of the Holy Spirit by following the peace. Allowing the Holy Spirit to kind of bring me to this point. Okay, well, I, okay, I see that. Now I've got a peace about this. Okay, I, I've got a peace about this. The Holy Spirit dwells in you. He'll give you peace. If you'll let him. Follow the peace. And that can come over a spirit of time. You know, if we're believing God for something, and then we're hitting these constant roadblocks where there's no peace in it, that's a good indication that it's not God. But if we're in the process of discerning the guidance of the Holy Spirit and we just keep hitting these places where, okay, now God's giving me peace about that. Now God's giving me peace about that. That's a real good indication. God's all over that. God's in that. He's, he's leading you. Follow the peace. Philippians 4, 6 says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Letting, letting peace guard our hearts and mind is a choice we make, just like letting fear govern our mind and heart is a choice we make. And often that happens when we see the crashing waves of our reality rolling over us like Peter did. But it's a choice we make. You can choose peace or you can choose fear. You can choose peace or you can choose stress. You can choose peace or you can choose worry. But we really need to capture in our heart. Here is this, uh, the God, our God, in the form of the Holy Spirit. The third person of the Trinity, the Godhead, is now dwelling in here so we can hear his voice and be guided by his presence into all truth. That's who lives in you. Saints, Christians, born-again believers. God does. And he is just, he is just waiting to give us his guidance. If we'll just slow down. Let him, to, let him guide. Uh, I was reminded of Pastor Ferris Whitehead, which used to be one of our apostolic coverings. He passed away. He was the pastor of Eastern Heights. But he would say to us, and I was reminded of this this past week in a meeting. He would say to us, listen, the Holy Spirit sits on the edge of your bed. He sits right on the edge of your bed waiting for you to wake up. <laughs> He's just sitting on the edge of your bed waiting for you to wake up so he can talk to you. So he can speak into your life and give you his guidance. He's just waiting, just waiting for you to wake up and wake up. And what we do is we jump out of bed. We check our phones. We're running to here and we're running to there. And we don't give him any time at all to speak into our life. Oh, that we would just roll over and just kind of, I'm just going to wait right here. Lord, I'm going to listen to you this morning. I'm going to start my day with praise and thanksgiving. Let your guidance come into my life. Oh, that we would do that instead of what happened on Facebook. Amen. Amen. So the point is this. When there is a conflict rages between our faith and our reality, the law of divine guidance requires us to have a God said moment. It requires us to let peace rule our heart and it, and it, requ it requires us to uh, over a spirit of time let that guidance come to discern over a period of time and not to assume oh man uh, can I ask you as you think about your conflict do you have a God said moment really I mean are, are you letting him lead you 
because this is so important. And are you willing to take a different direction if he leads you down a different path? Are you willing to follow the peace? There's a scripture that says this in Proverbs 29, 18. says, when people do not accept divine guidance, they run wild. But whoever obeys the law is joyful. And sometimes it's hard to accept the guidance he's given us. But if we will, if we will, there's wisdom in that. Secondly and lastly, I don't know if I can do this in one minute. I'll see. Well, I absolutely know I can't do it in one minute. <laughs> By faith. By faith, you won't get wore out as you tarry. <laughs> Real quickly, though, I've got, to, I've got to cover this one. This is so good. The law of resting in God's presence. The law of resting in God's presence. In other words, finding yourself in that place of rest where your faith can be refreshed, where you can find yourself strong again. Because when the war rages, when the conflict rages, man, you get wore out. You, 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 war, you, you spiritual warriors know what I'm talking about. And you got to find yourself resting in God's presence, relaxing in his, in his presence. Acts, says, Acts 3.19 says, Repent therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Now whether it's dealing with sins in your life or whether it's de dealing with faith in your life, the, the fact is times of refreshing comes from the presence of the Lord. When we enter into that presence of the Lord, when we just soak in the presence of the Lord, when we just find ourselves saying, Lord, Lord, I'm just going to worship you. I'm going to sit here. I'm going to listen. I'm going to tarry and let your, your mighty presence come into my life and rekindle and refresh my faith. Talking about those moments, those experiences, whether it's in worship or whether it's in your prayer closet or driving down the road, and you're just in the presence of God, loving him and letting him love you. Faith is refreshed. In the military, we call that R&R, &R, rest and recuperation. And I'm going to tell you something. It's when you're weary and stressed out that all those bullets and fiery darts of the enemy comes and they defeat you and your faith takes a nosedive. The Lord calls us to a position of rest. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. Come to me, all who are labor. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden. I will give you rest. The Lord says, come. That's a, that's a, that's a, a, a God said moment. The Lord says, come. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Verse 29. For I am gentle and lowly in heart and you will find rest for your souls. That, that's a God said moment. That's a God said moment for some people in this room right now. The Greek word for rest is defined as to cease from any movement or labor in order to recover. In order to recover strength. That's what that word rest means in the Greek. Uh, it's defined as a calm and patient expectation. Can you, can you see how a calm and patient expectation, uh, can you see how recovery of your strength can affect your faith? So it's the law of resting in God's presence so you can recover, so you can rekindle that strength that's been zapped from you by the enemy and by all your struggles. The law of resting in God's presence has the power to change your reality, has the power to create a faith in you so powerful that it moves the most powerful thing in the universe, God, to break into your reality with his reality. Why? Because you're resting and your faith is refreshed and strengthened. If you're thinking you've got to do more in your faith, no, you've got, to do, you've got to do less. You've got to learn to rest. And then your faith begins to explode and God eyeballs it. <laughs> he eyeballs it. Do you know how to rest in God's presence? Do you know how to rest in God's presence? 
I'm going to finish with this. I'll close with this. Just a little instruction on resting in God's presence. Psalms 131 says this, Lord, my heart is not proud. Here's King David, who was a warrior, man of faith, learned to rest in God's presence. We can all agree with that. Lord, my heart is not proud. My eyes are not haughty. I don't concern myself with matters too great or too awesome for me to grasp. Verse two says, instead, I have calmed and quieted myself like a weaned child who no longer cries for his mother's milk. Yes, like a weaned child is my soul within me. Oh, Israel, put your hope in the Lord now and always. Put your hope in the Lord now and always. So secret to rest. We don't concern ourselves with matters too great for us to handle. Your translation may say too great for us to understand. Your translation may say uh, too great for us to uh, conceive. One translation says, I don't waste my time on impossible schemes. I thought that was pretty good. So first and foremost, we don't, we don't waste our time on things that we just can't do anything about. We can't handle it anymore. It's too much for us to hold on to. So I'm going to let go of that. I'm going to lay it at the feet of Jesus. I'm going to release that burden, and I'm just going to rest in the Lord. This is how you rest. Number two, uh, it says, uh, here's another secret to rest is the psalmist said, I have calmed and quieted myself. To calm means to level or to equalize or to balance. I have calmed and quieted myself. Quiet, to quiet in the, he, in the Hebrew means to, to rest, to be silent, silent, to tarry or to wait. So I have found the balance and I have chosen to just wait on the Lord. That's a secret. And the last secret is this. This is the most important secret of all. I want you to find your balance of of waiting on the Lord, resting and waiting on the Lord. You'll find yourself releasing those burdens. And you'll find that your faith just zooms. But here's the most important one. The secret to rest is putting your hope in the Lord now and sometimes. Can we put that scripture back up there? Put your hope in the Lord now and sometimes. No, it says put your hope in the Lord now and always. Now and Monday, now and Tuesday, now and next week, now when whatever happens, happens. You put your hope in the Lord. You say, I'm going to hope in you, Lord. The law of resting in his presence. The law of resting in his presence, saints, is more valuable than you can possibly imagine. We don't think so, but it is. Sometimes we're ignorant of how valuable it is. The law of resting in his presence is the most valuable thing you can imagine. It's like the old man. The old man, I saw this on an antique road show, and I'll I'll close with this. Uh, On antique road show, this old guy had this old blanket on his easy chair. He just had it on his easy chair. He was an old guy. He was older than me. He's older than me and Wayne and me and Dick. He was an old guy. And he had this old blanket on his easy chair. And he, he thought, well, I'll just go see what this old blanket's worth. Maybe it's worth something. Takes it to Antique Roadshow. The, guy, the curator's mouth dropped open when he saw it. It was a Navajo blanket from the 1800s worth $350,000. And he just had it on his, in his easy chair. He just wrapped himself and keep, his, keep himself warm in it. And that's what we need to do with the Lord and we need to understand how valuable it is to let the Lord wrap us in his arms and keep us warm rest in the presence of the Lord amen it's the law that if we'll walk in it will engage the most powerful creation or being not creation the most powerful thing being God to transform our reality to his reality. Amen. Worship team, come up. I want to pray for you. You guys just strum and play. We're not going to sing a song. Y'all stand to your feet. The reality is the cowboy started eight minutes ago. 
I don't know if any of us even care anymore. I don't. Just strum. No song today. There's going to be people at the altar to pray for you. We're going to release everybody else to go. If you need prayer, we want to pray for you. I would ask you to bow your heads with me. Would you do that? Just bow your hearts before the Lord. I don't want to miss the opportunity that some of y'all need for the Holy Spirit to do something. But I just want to ask you, have you been operating in the law of resting in God's presence? Have you been violating that some way? Do you need to release something that you just really can't grasp it anymore? It's just too big for you to handle. Do you need to let something go? Have you been hanging on to it too long and it's time for you to lay this burden at the feet of Jesus? If that's you, if the Holy Spirit is speaking to you, I want you to place your hand over your heart right now. Amen. Amen. We're just going to ask this amazing, powerful God to do something right now in your hearts. And the Lord says, I will give you rest. The Lord says, I will give you peace. The Lord would say, don't search for those things among anything or anyone who cannot give it. I will give you rest. I will give you peace. If you've got your hand on your heart right now, I just want you to, I want you to do something right where you're at. Every head bowed, every eye closed, please. I want you to take both hands and I want you to take that thing you've been holding on to that you know the Lord is saying you got to let it go. You can't handle it. It's too big to grasp. And I want you to take both hands and I just want you to offer it up to the Lord right now. It's this raging conflict of faith and reality. I want you to take it. I want you to, I want you to offer it up to the Lord right now. And I want you to say in your own way, here it is, Lord. Here it is, Lord. I give it to you. You never intended for me to handle it anyway. Here it is, Lord. I give it to you. Here, Lord God. And maybe there's more than one thing. Just begin to give it to him. Now keep your hands up. Keep your hands up. Now I want you to see yourself taking and grasping his peace right now. I want you to see yourself grasping what he's giving you right now. He's giving you his peace. He's taking your burden now. He's giving you his peace to guard your heart and mind. He's giving you his peace right now. I want you to see yourself. I want you to see yourself literally in the spirit by faith. I want you to see yourself grasping that and bringing it down into your heart right now. I receive it, Lord. I receive it, Lord. I take it, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. I look up here, guys. That's a finished work. You by faith receive what God had on his side of reality to give to you in your reality. Let it, let it settle. Receive it. And every time you think about that conflict, say, you know what? God gave me a piece about that. I, I let that thing go. 